Hey everyone, welcome back to our Synoptic Gospel study. We are doing the Samaritan Woman today from John chapter 4. We'll be discussing it as we read. Um, so let's look at the first six verses and then we'll talk about those before we continue to the next part. So now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near that, sorry, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. All right, so this, this paragraph sets us up the background of the story. Like, why is Jesus in Samaria in the first place? What's going on? Um, so it tells us that the Pharisees, you know, the religious leaders from the temple, they were um, accusing Jesus of something. I don't really understand the accusation, but they were saying Jesus is baptizing more than John. And it wasn't true. It says that Jesus wasn't doing the baptizing. His disciples were doing the baptizing. But for some reason, um, the, the Pharisees were very upset about this because it forced Jesus to leave. So when the Pharisees started talking about this happening, Jesus left Judea. So I don't know, it was maybe like a, a pressure from them or they were going to come and cause disturbance in some way that was going to affect the ministry. Whatever it was, in Jesus' wisdom, he did not stay um, in that situation and, and left. Um, I think an application that we can look at just for that, um, it is sometimes okay to leave conflict. Um, I think at times we feel obligated to like plant our feet face to face with maybe other Christians that we disagree with or that are doing something we consider is wrong. And it's like, I got to fight this out. Um, and that's not necessary. You know, as Jesus showed, there are times when it's okay to walk away and say, this is not the time for this battle. There was going to be a time many times that Jesus was going to take on the Pharisees face to face and accuse them of their false teaching and of their legalism and all the stuff they did that was wrong. I mean, he did call them a group of snakes and graves. I mean, you know, <laughs> and not a good grave either. Like, you know, you look at on the outside, the inside you're dead. I mean, he had no problem calling them out for their wickedness, but he also chose when to have the battles, when to fight, when not to fight, when was it better to walk away? And I think um, there's a lot of wisdom in that for us to prayerfully consider when are the times to deal with people we disagree with in the faith and when is it not the time. So Jesus chose to leave Judea and um, he departed again for Galilee. So he was in Judea and he's going to Galilee. The quickest way, if you know anything about the, like the Israel map itself, if you look in the back of your Bibles if you need to, Samaria is right in the middle. And so between Galilee and Judea, and so it's like you can go through it, or you can go around it. And the Jews would usually go way around Samaria and get a very, very, very long trip to avoid putting their foot in Samaria. Um, the reason was racism. The hate of the Samaritan people and the sense of Jewish entitlement that they were so much better than the mixed breed Samaritans made them not want to go anywhere near them. The Samaritan people uh, were half Jew, half Gentile. Um, and with their racial differences, there were also cultural differences and religious differences between them. They had not kept the teachings of the Jewish side or the Gentile side. They had mixed them, uh, which we'll see when she starts talking to Jesus about um, the where they should worship. And they were considered dogs. Literally, that's how the Jews called them, were just dogs. Um, so Jesus was going from one side to the other, and the straight route was right through Samaria. So he went right through Samaria. Again, Jesus is not racist. Such a timely topic in the middle of international issues right now that everyone's aware of in America with the extreme racism issues and just the volatileness of what's happening in the rioting because of the racial division in America. And, you know, and there's a lot of 
opinions on both sides on what should happen and what shouldn't happen, et cetera, et cetera. But bottom line, there's a lot of racism. Racism is not just something that was between the Jews and the Samaritans. You know, that is something that happens um, in every culture. There's some culture that's hated. I mean, you look at Korea, Japan is hated. You know, like there's a lot of racism between Korea and Japan. Now, there are actual issues between the countries as well, but that shouldn't also create between the people. You can dislike what a government or what a policy or whatever it is without hating the people who are under that system. Um, so we have to be very careful about the way we choose to look at a person for whatever reason, their genetic difference, their government difference, their political beliefs, their personality, their appearance, et cetera, et cetera, their gender, whatever, whatever the problem is, you know, you're like, oh, I'm better. When, when that's the way I feel, like I'm not going to go near that person because my prejudice in some way about who they are makes me think I am good, they are bad. I am clean, they are dirty. That is what made the Jews not want to step into Samaria. They were clean in their mind, and the Samaritans were unclean in their mind. So therefore, they didn't want to dirty themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if ever we look into our own hearts and say, I feel that way about something. I feel that that kind of person or that type of sin that they do or that background or heritage that they have makes them someone that shouldn't be near me. I, I am better than them. I don't want to care for their issues. I don't want to help them. I don't want to consider the problem, etc. Then that's what we have to evaluate in our own hearts and say, why do I think I am better than that person? Like, or that that person is bad because of their existence? You know, like, no one can help what race they're born into, what country they're born into, what whatever they're born into that we don't like, you know. We have to really be careful that we are looking at people with love and with kindness and with gentleness. And we don't want to have this same mentality of, oh, I'm not going to walk through your neighborhood. I'm going to walk around it. And Jesus exemplifies that's not what you do. You go to them. You don't go around them. So that's what we see. Jesus was there. Um, he is going up to the well that was um, Jacob's had given to, to Joseph. So again, this area had been in heritage, a part of the Israel culture. Um, it was just at this time was Sumerian. All right, so let's look at verses um, 7 to uh, 16, so a longer group here. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Okay, now, um, the woman comes up to the well, and Jesus is like, I need some water. You know, he's been walking for a really long time, and as she pointed out, he has nothing to draw water with. He doesn't have a cup. He doesn't have a jar. He doesn't have anything to use the well, so he asks her for water. And she's like, hold up, oh, Jew, what are you doing? Like, why are you talking to me? That's not okay. You're a Jew. You want water? Um, now, Jesus doesn't deal with the racist side of her. In, in no, most situations of racism, it's not just one side. Like, both sides have issues. Yeah, you know, Just like the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, the Samaritans pointing out his Jewishness to him um, and like, whoa, dude. Jews don't do this. I don't understand why you're talking to me. Instead of dealing with that, 
Jesus starts talking about her actual need as a person. Um, and again, I think it's really important in any kind of situation where other people are tempted to deal with the racist, racial differences or political differences or religious differences. Instead, we need to look at a person's need. What is going on in their heart? How can I help them as a person? Get out of the system and deal with the individual. Um, look at their heart. Jesus said in the context of the situation that she needed eternal life. Now, I love that he uses the situation to talk about faith. When we are evangelizing someone, uh, evangelizing, sharing the gospel, talking to them about faith, it's really wise to use your situation, what's happening right now. Like, if you just walk up to a stranger and say a typical evangelism question like, do you have peace if you die tonight, you go to heaven? Most people will be like, <laughs> you know, it's awkward, right? Or, you know, the, the methods like that I am not disrespecting, like when the people are on the corners and they have a thing of tissue and they're like, God loves you. Here's tissue. And you're like, oh, hello, person. You know, like, yeah, it's like free tissue. Thanks, you know. And I, I mean, I don't dislike that method. It is a way of opening someone to an idea that like Christians are giving and, and nice and just here you go. No burden. Like that's OK, but it's not evangelism. Let's just make that clear. Handing someone a box of tissues, which for our international audience is a Korean method of evangelism or introduction to churches, inv inviting people to church, giving a little box of um, tissues to someone and just letting them know that God loves them. Like, and that's, it's not a bad thing. However, if we're going to be effective in sharing the gospel, actually helping people go from dead souls to living souls, just saying God loves you, come to church, is not evangelism. It might be a one step to help person turn towards, oh, church is nice, or Christians aren't scary. It can be a basic step, but it's not actually you sharing the gospel. When we share the gospel with someone, we are actually explaining to them how to have eternal life. That's not God loves you, come to church. That is a lot more detail. And that's what Jesus does. He starts with what he's doing. They are dealing with water and he uses the analogy of living water that can give her eternal life. He just uses this reality to share spiritual truth and we can do that like we can be with a friend at a coffee shop and talk about life talk about our beliefs talk about jesus and you can even like use coffee you know there are ways to use images and explain things with what you're using instead of just tripping someone running up to them and saying, God loves you, you need Jesus. So do you believe in your heart that if you die, you're gonna... That's awkward in many ways in many cultures. It doesn't help. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes you find a person who actually, in the moment of you speaking to them suddenly, is ready to hear about the gospel. Other people have helped them have open hearts. They've planted the seed. There's ideas about God. God's been convicting them and opening up their heart. And you're that one person that in that moment is able to share the gospel and for them to understand and receive eternal life. That does happen. And I think more um, effective evangelism is relationship, where you get to know someone and you sit down with them and you care about them as a person and you maybe share a cup of coffee or hand them a glass of water or do something that they need, you give them food or you give them help in some way. And in that process of seeing their situation or getting to know them as a friend, you are able to have a conversation about the gospel. Um, now this is a gospel opportunity that's random. This is a stranger. This is not a relationship that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman. He just sees an opportunity to share the gospel and he took it. So there's both kinds. I, and I just really wanna focus on that. And I don't think I'm making it clear because I haven't had any coffee yet today. <laughs> got out of bed late today um so let me just put it out when you share the gospel there's multiple different ways 
One way is to go up to people that you have no reason to talk to. There's no connection. There's no open door. You just create a conversation and share the gospel. Another is you find a way to bridge to talk to that person. Like you find a need that they have. Um, a need for friendship, a need for a language, like use English as a bridge. If you're in an international situation, you can use food for the hungry or help for someone who's needy. Um, all kinds of like a bridge, a, way, a method for a logical connection between you and that person. And then through that act of kindness or helpfulness or love, you are showing them that God loves them and then you're talking to them about what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. Another way is to have random situations like the Samaritan woman where you're in a place to talk to someone for whatever reason that you didn't design, it just happens, and then you use whatever is going on with that person to lead to talking about the gospel. And that's what Jesus did in this moment. All of those methods can be effective if through the process of our connection to that other individual, we are actually explaining to them how to have eternal life. If in our attempt to evangelize, we never actually do anything except invite someone to church, we are not evangelizing. Um, evangelism doesn't mean come to church, it's come to Jesus. And we have to question what are we saying? Am I telling this person how to have eternal life or am I simply telling them to be religious? And we are the ones that create problems when we just tell people how to be religious. And then we try to correct it later. Well, you can't just come to church. You have to know Jesus. It's like, well, they always just told me to come to church. <laughs> you know? So we have to be very careful about that, that we're actually talking someone to eternal life. So Jesus in this moment of water, uses the water to say, I could give you water that never runs out. You'll have eternal water flowing from within you until eternal life. And the Samaritan woman thinks he means literally giving water that makes you not thirsty physically. So she's like, yes, please, I want this. Now, Jesus, knowing that she doesn't fully understand, but he's still seizing this opportunity and using it then tells her to go get her husband. So let's read that part. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped. <laughs> that always makes me laugh. It just, <laughs> she's like, oh, prophet. All right. She doesn't deal with all the other stuff. You know, it's just great. Okay. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth the woman said to him I know that Messiah is coming he was called Christ when he comes he will tell us all things and Jesus said to her I am uh, no, I who speak to you am he. All right. Now, in the first part of the conversation with him, he gives her like a desire to keep listening to him when he offers the eternal water. That gives her like a, a little nugget of interest. Oh, I want that. But he didn't just say, great, here it is. That's another mistake we make in evangelism. It's like, do you want to believe? Yes, good, a believer. And we can't, we can't do that. It's not just about getting a passionate response and then falsely giving someone hope that that means they have eternal life simply because they are interested, because it doesn't. The first thing Jesus dealt with was her sin. We have to deal with our sin natures to be Christians. Confess your sins 
and be healed. Like it's not just believe, it is believe and confess. Like there is repentance and faith, not just faith. Sometimes we only focus on the faith part, just believe in Jesus, and we don't focus on the repentance part, admit that we are sinners. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, I know that when I was doing training for teaching children about the gospel, one thing they taught us is like it's the ABCs. A is admit that you're a sinner. B is believe. Then C is confess. There's multiple parts of truly acknowledging our need for Christ. So Jesus does this here. He first brings her to a point to have to admit that she's a sinner. So he says, go get your husband. Let's talk. And now also just from a, from a um, pastoral training point of view, um, when a man is evangelizing a woman, it is real important that he bring in her husband and not just have a relationship individually. Like a pastor or a, a leader shouldn't say, hey, individual woman, let's go get coffee and talk about Jesus. No, <laughs> you bring in her family. Um, that way there's no question of reputation or of in, inappropriate behavior. So Jesus is both pointing out her issues and doing what is culturally and um, purity demanding that he not just uh, meet her needs individually, but he bring in her whole family. So there's multiple things in this statement. So he tells her, you go get your husband and come back and we'll talk. And then she's like, oh, I, I don't have a husband. Now, normally, whenever we're going to deal with our sin, the first thing to do is to hide it. Mm -hmm. That's what Adam and Eve did. Jesus, well, I mean, Jesus, God, when he came looking for him, hey, where are you? Why are you hiding? You know, they were behind a bush hoping God didn't see them in their nakedness. When Jesus points out that she needs to bring her husband to talk to him, she's just like, oh, I don't have one. She hid her sin. So Jesus, like, I, I, it's almost sarcastic, and I love it. He's like, you know, you're right. That is not a lie. Because of the five men you've been married to, this one's just a boyfriend. <laughs> you know? Uh, he's like, okay. Now, of course, this is kind of um, risky, uh, like her lifestyle of five husbands plus a boyfriend that she's living with in any culture is sinful, you know? But especially during this day when you didn't have the open sexuality that you have in today's world. You know, there's a, a whole lot of modernness allows a little bit more freedom that we should not have, but it's a little bit less shy about, oh, they're divorced from married, divorced from married, divorced from married. We're like, well, whatever, life. But in this day, that would have been very, very poignantly separating. That's why she came to the well alone. She wasn't with the other women. Women normally went together to get water from the well. She did not. Why? Because she would have been a social outcast because of her sin. It was a publicly known issue, and it would have separated her. Now, Jesus is dealing with a woman who is not only racially separated from him as a person by culture, but separated from her own culture because of her sin. In her complete public sinfulness, she's still trying to hide it from Jesus. People are shamed by their sin. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want the social rejection. Um, and Jesus' response to her wasn't, okay, stop lying. We all know you're a terrible person, bad, bad, bad. That's not what he does. He just acknowledges it. He tells her what he knows about her. And that is how God deals with us. God points out our sin and he says, you have sinned. I, I, I really love the fact that God does not shame us for our sins. Satan shames us. Satan brings a lot of negative emotions. Jesus says, you have sinned. He waits for us to agree, and then he offers forgiveness and cleansing. He doesn't ignore our sin, but he also doesn't hurt us for our sin. Now, if we continue to refuse to repent of our sin, we will be punished and into eternal damnation and hell. But yet remember, hell is not God saying, I hate you, go to hell. It's us saying, I don't want to repent. I don't want forgiveness. And then being 
trapped in our sins, punishments. So look at how Jesus deals with this and just points out the truth. This is what you've done. You are a sinner. Now, at this point, she could have had many responses. And when we're talking to people, they can have lots of different ways of dealing with this kind of acknowledgement of their sinfulness. Hers was to go super religious. Uh, and people will do this. It, it's one of the categories of responses when you're talking to someone about the gospel. If you point out their sin, sometimes they want to look better. Um, and so they'll start trying to turn the direction away from them and onto a religious debate. And so that's what she does. She goes, oh, you're a prophet. So, okay, Samaritans, we worship here. And Jews worship here. Now, what would that normally have done? That normally would have made someone start fighting. And that would have got the attention off of her and her guilt and shame and directed it to a religious debate. We have to be so careful when we share the gospel not to be diverted to a religious debate because that is not helping anyone. If there's a difference of theology or of practice that someone's like, oh, well, we do it this way. Your turn. Fight back. You know, don't do it. Jesus he answered her question. He's like, well, you don't understand the problem. You're not going to worship on this mountain or that mountain. It's, it's in truth. He just, he heard the question and instead of letting it be a debate, he gave her truth. He told her, you're asking the wrong question. It's not about where you worship. It's who you worship. And God wants you to worship in spirit and in truth, not at a place. That is still... A significant point for all of us um, sometimes we want to go to church and worship or pray and we think that's where I need to be and God's response is it's not about where you go it's about worshiping in spirit and in truth now we're called to unity with believers but that can be in a park too we can have unity of believers and worship together and it not be inside a building a lot of missions and ministry your worship is under a tree because it's a place to gather. The church is the group of people gathering together. It's not about the building that you meet in. And we don't want to be like the Jews and Samaritans who fight between their church building and their church building. Where do we worship? It's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And that is very significant today, not just between this individual conversation happening then. Now, Jesus points out that the truth does come through the Jews. The Old Testament that we follow is still truth. It's not wrong. So he didn't say, yeah, the Jews are wrong and the Samaritans are wrong. But he said the truth is coming through the Jews, but everything's about to change. It's going to be about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? As believers now in this day and age, after Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to live in the hearts of believers. Now, that's different than what it was before. In the Old Testament, they were still saved by faith, not by works or anything like that, but they didn't have the same kind of indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, there were individuals who would be anointed with the Holy Spirit, like David, when he was writing scripture. Um, he would talk about that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And, but that was not every individual person of faith was not filled with the Holy Spirit. That is something that we are given today. And when we worship God, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship God if you do not have his spirit. Religious people who just want to go to church and worship God, but they don't want to surrender their hearts to God. They don't want to have that complete submission where God takes over and his spirit lives in our hearts and I no longer can do what I want to do I have to be submitted to obedience to God that step for a lot of people is too much they don't want submission to God they don't want control of God so they're just like I'll just be religious I'll just go to church like this I'll go to a place Jesus is like no it's not about just going to a place you must worship in spirit and in truth um, what we do must be truth. It must be scripture. When we worship, it can't just be about experience. It just can't be, you know, this passionate experience that I feel emotional about God. It must be based in his truth. If it's something outside of the word of God, it's not good. Jesus gives a very clear 
this is what we need. And we all still need that reminder today that we not get pulled into any other kind of religious concepts of experience or um, outside added truth. The Bible is truth. The Spirit must live in us, and then we can worship God, not about the place. I love that he gives us just that real clarity here. All right. Now, she, in that, recognized Jesus as Messiah. She's like, I know a Messiah is coming, and Jesus identified himself. I am that Messiah, the promised one who was going to come and take away the sins of the world. That's what Messiah was. They knew what that meant. Um, now, some people thought it was political um, and not spiritual, but she knew that this person of God was coming, and Jesus identified himself. So then what happens? Just then, <laughs> his disciples came back. Just a note on evangelism. Right when you're saying the important stuff, like Jesus saying, I am the Messiah, interruptions happen. Satan always causes distractions when you're sharing the gospel with a person. Like when you're really talking about their soul and there's truth and there is a spark of belief and you see that because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You are speaking the word of God. You see that faith sparking in response to that and you're bringing them to that do you want to make a decision to give yourself to Jesus, to be filled with the spirit, to be forgiven. In that moment, something happens every time loud noises, people coming in, animals, like all kinds of crazy stuff will happen in those moments because Satan is just really one focus, and that is to keep people from coming to Christ. Yeah, it works hard, works real hard. And so we have to be wise. When you recognize that something has happened to distract, for example, right when I was explaining how to come to Christ, I was going through it, very, very loud noises outside blocked the recording. Now, so I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> when you are telling someone to come to Jesus, you see their faith blooming, and they are able to make a decision. Do you want to receive Jesus as your personal Savior? Don't let Satan distract. If horrible, loud noises happen, say it again. Don't let the distraction of religious argument, of cultural issues, or a satanic intervention keep you from sharing the gospel when God has given you that kind of opportunity. So right then the disciples came back. Right when Jesus identifies himself as the Messiah, which again is important. Sorry, there's just so many points in the story. He didn't identify himself as Messiah very often in his ministry. He showed it through his works, but it's very rare that he just said, I am the Messiah. Like That's much later in his ministry that that comes out again. But for her... In this private moment, he told her that he was the Messiah. So the disciples come back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? <laughs> so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So right when Jesus identifies himself as the Messiah, the disciples walk up and they're like, uh, why are you talking to a woman? But they didn't say anything. So like the fact that this is written, it tells us it was very clear what their attitudes were like, what are you doing? But no one actually said it. And she leaves. Now, those kind of interruptions happen, but this one worked out well. Because in this moment of leaving, all these men come, and so she leaves. She runs back to town and tells everyone, I think I found the Christ. Now, this is also such a um, like textbook evangelism thing. When someone truly comes to Christ, they recognize that he is truth. He is the Messiah. They're going to go tell other people. We cannot keep it to ourselves. The joy of meeting God individually in our own hearts we cannot keep silent if you can stay silent then you need to reevaluate have i truly met christ mm -hmm. if you never want to talk about him if there's no need to share with others if there's no joy or excitement that you know your sins are forgiven that there is hope for eternal existence if that doesn't make you want to tell the people that you love that there is hope you may not actually have the hope you just got religious 
She runs back and says, people come, come, come see what I have found. That should be anyone's true response to meeting Christ is to tell others, come and see. So she runs and tells and she brings them back. And what happens? Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then come the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor." Um, Jesus points out this very, very beautiful concept in evangelism that some people plant the seeds and other people gather. Um, when you're spreading the gospel and people don't receive Christ, you are the person who's giving that initial seed. Someone else can come later and pick the fruit. And Jesus teaches his disciples in this moment about evangelism. Jesus is teaching constantly. He doesn't miss an opportunity to train them how to evangelize. So they're talking about food, and he uses that to train them about the sustaining power of God to keep sharing the gospel and planting and gathering so that many souls could have eternal life. So first he's evangelizing, and then he uses the opportunity to train. He's working and training. It's constantly what he's doing with, with his ministry, and we can read it and be trained as well. So last part, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I mean, that's, that sentence alone is just really important. Many believed because of the woman's testimony. Our testimonies of how God has changed us, how God has saved us, what he has done in our lives is what can bring many to Christ. When she said, he told me all that I ever did, she went around telling people. She no longer was ashamed to talk about her sin but she said how Jesus had changed her because of that sin. And that should be us too. Instead of dwelling on our past and any sins that we're guilty or shamed for, instead showing how God has redeemed us from that sin, how he's forgiven us, how he has cleansed us, and let that testimony bring other people to him. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed Jesus because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Again, in evangelism, when we use our testimonies to share with other people, that's one step that can make them start listening to Christ. But at some point, they have to believe for themselves based on the word of God. Testimony is one beginning. We have to go back to the word and share what Jesus has said about himself, not just what I say about Jesus and my experience with Jesus. There's nothing wrong with using our testimonies. That's very good, but don't stop with that. As they said, um, we don't believe because of your word. We believe because of his word. Her word started their interest. The word of Christ brought them to true belief. So when you share your testimony as an introduction to a friend or a family member and they're interested, then you turn to scripture and use the word of God to explain following Christ so that they can have belief in him. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, not my words. My words can bring a conversation. God's word brings true change and belief. So an important concept there. Now, 43. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Now that continues to some issues that Jesus dealt with when he got back to Galilee, so it's a different story. But just the beautiful concept here that Jesus met a woman who was socially and racially and culturally should have been distant from him, and he ignored all of those human issues. She was rejected by her culture because of his, her sin, he identified her sins so that she could know him, um, but not 
to shame or to rebuke her, but to deliver her. And then she used that testimony to bring others to Christ. And they truly believed because of his word. Uh, all of that together, while teaching us to ignore religious debate or satanic intervention or other religious people, the disciples' opinions of what we're doing, train them, teach them, don't let them stop you. The disciples came up and they wanted to stop Jesus, but instead he trained them. Oftentimes other peoples in our churches may disagree with our evangelism or something, and we need to train them to understand evangelism, not just let it be a point of contention or attack, um, but let it be a growing point for them as well. Everything we do to be like Christ should be telling others about eternal life and helping Christians grow in their faith. And he was doing both at the same time. When we start actively recognizing God has changed me, God has given me hope and truth, and I want to give that to others, then we are going to have religious debates, religious opinions, satanic attack. But the more we are in spirit and in truth, staying to the word of God and being filled with his spirit, we can, like Christ, see great change and great belief. And the Christians also can change and be trained. So beautiful, beautiful story. Um, for those watching, if you have any questions or comments or just exultation you would like to share, please send me a message. And I hope this has been a blessing for you today. Bye.